In this video, I'll be sharing some of the worst nutrition mistakes pretty much every lifter makes at some point, myself included. In fact, I really wish I knew about these things when I started lifting over 10 years ago, because if I had just known them from the start, I would have made better gains without so many unnecessary challenges. All right, the first mistake most people make is thinking that you can force feed muscle growth. You can't. I think a lot of people see pro bodybuilders eating 5,000 plus calorie diets and assume that if they also want to get big, they need to also eat big. There may be a kernel of truth to this for some lifters, but the reality is that bodybuilding anecdotes are often unreliable. That's because pro bodybuilders have world-class genetics, have already been training for a decade or more, and are almost always taking large doses of anabolic steroids. So it's hard to know if the results are coming from the fact that they're eating big to get big or some combination of those other factors. Now, the reason I say that you can't force feed muscle growth is that studies consistently show that when you overfeed someone with a large caloric surplus, they gain disproportionately more fat than they do muscle. And this is true even if they're weight training. This 2013 study from Garth and colleagues perfectly illustrates the issue with really aggressive bulking. These researchers split 47 elite athletes into two groups. One group ate in a relatively large caloric surplus, and one group ate in a relatively small caloric surplus. The large surplus group ended up eating 621 more calories on average. Both groups followed the same weight training program for 10 weeks, and after 10 weeks, this is what they found. The group eating in the large caloric surplus did, predictably, gain more weight. They also gained a tiny bit more lean mass, although it didn't reach the statistical significance, but the big difference was in the amount of fat they gained. The large surplus group gained much more fat than the small surplus group. So eating the extra calories didn't lead to substantially more muscle gain, but it did lead to substantially more fat gain. These same basic findings were corroborated by a later 2019 study, which has led experts in the field to describe nutrition as having a permissive role in muscle building. In other words, your diet permits muscle growth to occur. It doesn't cause muscle growth to occur. You can't force feed muscle growth. Training is what tells the muscle to grow. Nutrition simply supplies the building blocks. If you think of your body like a big building, you can think of your training program as the blueprint and the construction crew, and you can think of your nutrition as the building blocks. If you have way more building blocks than you need, they just pile up at the job site. This is the muscle you've built, and this is what's left over as fat. So when looking to build muscle, most lifters should be eating somewhere in this range. But this line here in the middle being your maintenance calories, the number of calories you need to maintain your weight. If you wanna gain muscle faster and are more comfortable with some fat gain, you can put yourself in a 10 to 20% surplus. If you'd like to do a leaner bulk, a smaller five to 10% surplus would be better. And if you're trying to prioritize fat loss while still building muscle, a slight caloric deficit in this zone would be best. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that aggressive bulks are necessarily a bad thing. So-called dreamer bulks have become something of a rite of passage in the lifting world. And despite what the short-term Garth study found, in my coaching experience, I have found that more aggressive bulks do tend to lead to more strength gain over the long term. Aggressive bulking will also help you take up more total space, a la bear mode, but they can also make your life more difficult the next time you want to cut down, and in my coaching experience, just end up not being worth it for most people. Now, I'm planning on doing a full video about sustainable bulking, similar to the one that I recently did on sustainable fat loss, so I'll save the rest of my bulking suggestions for that video. Okay, the second mistake most people make is not realizing that most supplements are overrated. Now, there are a few supplements that actually do work. Creatine, caffeine, and protein powder are at the top of my short list when it comes to building muscle. However, even with these three most science-based supplements, I think a lot of people, including people in the science-based lifting community, still overestimate how much muscle people will actually gain from taking them. For example, creatine is one of the most highly researched and most efficacious supplements on the market. This is true, and we hear it so much, that I think it leads a lot of new lifters to think they're gonna notice a massive steroid-like boost from it. In reality, most studies show that taking creatine should result in a roughly two to three pound increase in lean mass. For example, this eight week training study found that a group taking creatine gained 1.1 kilograms or 2.2 pounds more lean mass than a group taking placebo. Similarly, this systematic review, which pulled together 22 studies on older subjects, found that creatine increased lean mass by 1.4 kilos or just about three pounds more than placebo. And those studies ranged from seven weeks to a full year in length. Again, it isn't that creatine doesn't work, it clearly does, and two to three pounds of lean mass is still significant. It's a solid increase, and given the relatively cheap price point of simple creatine monohydrate, it's definitely worth taking, in my opinion. However, compared to a bodybuilding steroid cycle, which can add upwards of 10 to 20 pounds of lean mass in just a month or two, it's also worth tempering your expectations. Caffeine is another supplement that I personally use and that has a lot of scientific research supporting its efficacy for strength, power, and muscular endurance. Caffeine can definitely give you a mental boost before training, and anecdotally, I do find it leads to better workouts. 
However, the research as a whole isn't particularly exciting when it comes to muscle growth specifically. Again, it isn't that caffeine doesn't work, it does, it's just important to temper your expectations. If pre-workout caffeine is the only thing that's able to get you up off the couch and through the gym doors, then it could be having a huge behavioral impact on your gains. But if you're going to be training anyway, the muscle gains you'll see specifically as a result of caffeine supplementation is nothing astronomical. Lastly, protein powder is a supplement I often recommend that has a large amount of scientific literature supporting its use for muscle growth. Protein powders are very convenient and can make hitting your daily protein targets easier. However, if you're able to hit your daily protein target with high protein foods alone, adding extra protein powder won't provide any extra gains. So as I see it, protein powder simply provides a very convenient option for getting in some high quality protein, but it's not magic. It's just another food option. And again, I personally take all three of these supplements and I'd recommend them to any serious lifter who can budget them. But as you go further and further down the list, the supplements get less and less promising. The third mistake most people make is thinking you need a super high protein diet to build muscle. You don't. This is actually something I've updated my stance on over the last few years. I used to recommend protein intakes a bit higher than I do now, but I've updated that based on new research. A lot of people seem to think that if you just load up on protein, your body will have to build more muscle. After all, muscle is made up of protein, so the more protein you eat, the more muscle you'll build. It makes intuitive sense, but in reality, research shows that the effect of protein on muscle growth is magnitude smaller than the effect of training. Eating protein gives these short-lived blips in muscle protein synthesis, while training causes this long and prolonged elevation, the elevation that's ultimately driving new growth. Now, according to the latest research, the optimal protein target for building muscle in a caloric surplus is 0.7 to 1 gram of protein per pound of body weight, or 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilo. Practically speaking, I put most people in the middle, and going above that range won't cause more gains. If you're in a caloric deficit for fat loss, shifting protein slightly higher to 0.8 to 1.2 grams per pound is smart to prevent muscle loss or even allow muscle gain in some instances. Personally, I'm still cutting at the moment and I eat 150 grams of protein per day at 165 pounds body weight. So that's about 0.9 grams of protein per pound of body weight for me. I just say this to show that even sitting toward the lower end of these ranges is still perfectly fine, and I usually only suggest going to the upper end if someone is really shredded and at a particularly high risk of muscle loss. Of course, it's also important to realize that even if you eat below these ideal ranges, you can still build muscle, it just may not happen as quickly. A recent systematic review from Morton and colleagues found that people tend to build more and more muscle as they increase protein, but only up to 0.7 grams per pound. That's where the trend hits a breakpoint. Going up from there doesn't seem to do much of anything extra. But that doesn't mean no gains occur if you go below 0.7 grams per pound. They do. If you were to eat just 0.5 grams per pound, you'd still build muscle, just not as quickly. So if you can't afford a high protein diet or you don't wanna eat a high protein diet, you can still build muscle. It'll just take a bit longer. And it may also be reassuring to know that the optimal level of protein intake is still quite a bit lower than what most of the bodybuilding magazines say. The fourth mistake a lot of people make is misunderstanding meal frequency. Many people don't realize that the number of meals you should eat per day for fat loss is really up to you. Now, I'm tempted to say that the number of meals you eat per day doesn't matter, but that isn't quite true. For some people, eating one or two large meals per day within a time-restricted feeding window will be much more effective at helping them reduce their total daily caloric intake and lose more fat as a result. Still, for other people, restricting their eating window can make the diet feel more difficult. They might find that their energy is lower throughout the day and their hunger is less manageable. So for them, a higher frequency grazing meal pattern where they eat four, five, or six smaller meals spaced throughout the day would most likely be more effective. Of course, the good news is that we have a ton of flexibility to try both. That's because the scientific literature shows that when we equate caloric intake and protein intake, one approach isn't significantly better than another. This is why I think it's very important that people not grind through eating six to eight meals a day just because it's supposed to speed up your metabolism doesn't, and why it's also important that people not struggle sticking to intermittent fasting just because it's supposed to be better at burning belly fat. It isn't. You just need to find a meal pattern that'll help you follow through on the diet better. Now, it's worth mentioning that muscle growth does seem to be slightly impacted by the number of meals you eat per day, but also probably not to the extent that most people think. A recent study from 2021 found that there was no significant difference in muscle gained between a group eating three meals a day versus six meals a day. So you can eat anywhere from three to six protein-containing meals per day and expect to see very similar muscle growth. 
However, another study from the previous year in 2020 found that eating three meals a day did trend toward more muscle growth than only eating two meals a day with a fairly large effect size, even though it didn't reach statistical significance. So as of now, I think that for fat loss, one to six meals per day is perfectly fine, but for muscle growth, three to six meals is probably slightly more optimal than just one to two meals. Still, I should point out that in the 2020 study, the two meal group did of course still make gains and the difference between two meals and three meals wasn't enormous. Now, before we go, I wanna mention one last thing that I really wish I knew about when I first started learning about nutrition, which is the Macro Factor Diet App. If you aren't aware, I'm a part owner of Macro Factor and I've been part of the app's development since the very beginning. And I truly believe it's the best algorithm-based nutrition coaching app on the market. Like I said in the video, effective bodybuilding nutrition isn't about force feeding calories, finding a magic supplement, eating as much protein as possible, or keeping to a perfect meal schedule. Instead, the two most important things you can do are consistently hit a caloric target that's appropriate for your goal and eat enough protein to support muscle mass. However, because everyone's diet needs are different and they can change over time, depending on changes to your metabolism, your training habits, and your body composition, you need to continually update your calories and macronutrients. Macrofactor will take care of all this for you based on your individual body's response to the plan. Macrofactor's weight trend tool and regular weekly check-ins will provide feedback and adjustments to help ensure that your weight is moving in the right direction. A lot of cuts end up turning into crash diets because it can be hard to know when and how much to adjust your calories, and a lot of bulks turn into dirty bulks because it can be hard to tell if you're gaining muscle fast enough. Again, Macrofactor will take care of all that for you with its science-based algorithms. So if this sounds like something you'd like to try out for yourself, you can get a free two-week trial of Macrofactor at the first link in the description box below. Also, make sure you get into the Macrofactor Facebook group and subreddit when you sign up, as those are both really active communities where you can ask questions, post updates, share recipes, and help you stay accountable. All right, that's it for this one, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to leave me a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys all here in the next one.